This is gonna hurt. It's time, it's time for, the for the Suffering Podcast. 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 We fight for our lives every day. There is nothing that comes easy, and most believe that hard work will result in success. The only grace that every human desires is to be given the same opportunities on that road. It is tragic when unnecessary obstacles or roadblocks are put in our path. We all want to be afforded the chance at the same resources and education provided to the rest of our field. The tragedy would lie in the inequality to achieve the same goals that are in front of others around you. Some would say the lucky ones are allowed to walk through life with less struggle. They forego the suffering at a better chance for success. In reality, the fortunate ones are the ones that suffer and struggle the most, as they will be the ones that appreciate their achievements the most. I'm Kevin Donaldson, here with Mike Felace, and on this episode of The Suffering Podcast, we sit down with Dr. Leija Carter to discuss the suffering of inequity. Dr. Leija has taken a stance with her nonprofit and really tried to change the, the dynamic of, of food inequity. Mm-hmm. All right. So, Dr. Leija, thank you so much for joining us. You've been this interesting character that has sort of come to us. <laughs> character? I don't know if character is a good word, though, is it? Yeah, I, yeah, you you person. are a character. <laughs> She's a character. You are a character. We we, we met Dr. Leija a couple weeks ago. Yes, or, or a week ago or so, and we had probably one of the most intense conversations. It was like, and I said to you, it's like a whole a whole it podcast right here. Intense. No, we just we just sat around and talked. I mean, yeah. we talked for over an hour. Yeah, for like yeah, like a close to two hours. <laughs> yeah. But thank you so much for coming in today, mm-hmm. and I appreciate you. It's, putting up with us for almost two hours. <laughs> Before we start, let's give a shout out to our marquee sponsor. That's Toyota of Hackensack. We don't trust anybody, but we do trust Toyota of Hackensack. So if you're looking for a car, go to toyotaofhackensack.com and let them find you a car. Now, this episode, I want to give a big shout out to the Super Bowl champion, Philadelphia Eagles, because I know you're a Philadelphia Eagles fan. Yes, sir. All right, so I'll leave now. The, the airing date is February 5th of this episode. Which, which will be around Super Bowl Sunday. Actually, listen, the truth be told, this is not February 5th when we're recording this, <laughs> but I am like Nostradamus, and I am going to say the Philadelphia Eagles it. are going to win. I said mm. the e- Eagles and Bills in the Super Bowl. That's my prediction. Eagles are going to win. Eagles are going to win. I'm not saying who's going to win. Eagles, I'm not a gambler, man, but Eagles and Bills in the Super Bowl. Let's defer to our guest. Mm-hmm. Okay. Dr. Carter, who is going to win the Super Bowl? Fly, Eagles, fly. That's right. <laughs> fly, Eagles, fly. Oh, yeah. Look at that. Look at that. I've been waiting for two years to get an Eagles fan in here. <laughs> we, had a, we had a Philadelphia Flyers person in here. Who wasn't even an Eagles fan. <laughs> he wasn't even an Eagles oh, fan. Well, oh, okay. Well, but he's a, we'll he's a real good friend of mine. And, and it turns out he's the chaplain for the Jets. So <laughs> guess which games I get to go to. I get to go to the Jets games. But uh, you're a South Jersey girl. I am. And... That's also another thing that's near and dear to my heart because I'm a South Jersey boy. That's why well, we're... you're you're a shore boy. No, well, I'm a beach kid. Okay, so, a beach kid, but so, you know we don't the... we don't consider the Atlantic City South Jersey. We consider that the shore. <laughs> Only people from North Jersey call it the shore. I consider I consider Atlantic City like Delaware. <laughs> that's not even New Jersey. <laughs> I mean, but we've all been there. Yes, but we've all been we've there. All been. So, Dr. Carter, you, you've traveled a long way. You've, you've got a, a really interesting story to yourself because you're, you're really a self-made woman, and I'd love to know a little bit more about you. So why don't you tell our audience a little bit about yourself? Toughest question you're going to get all night. Yep. You know, like, where do I start? Exactly. That's you why know? it's the toughest question. <laughs> um, I mean. Where'd you grow up? Let's start there. South, South Jersey. South Jersey. Yeah, there's no. only one. <laughs> there's like the Raritan Bridge in South Jersey. Exactly. If you're not from North Jersey, <coughs> you're from South Jersey. See, now or the Ke- shore. No, Kevin's a Benny. No, 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 no. Down there, we call them Shoebies. Mm-hmm. So you know why we call them Shoebies? And so down, when you go down the rare past like Belmar, your, your tourists that come in are Pennsylvania tourists. Mm-hmm. So, you know, Belmar is New York tourists. Down there is Pennsylvania tourists. And mm-hmm. we call them Shoebies. Benny's is a term for like Belmar. Shoebies, because in the 60s, they used to bring their lunches in shoeboxes. Mm. And so if you go down there and you, and, and you mention the word shoebie, a local will say, oh, yeah, they're coming. I, was, they're coming. I wasn't alive in the 60s. <laughs> you were alive in the 50s. What are you Shut talking up. about? Oh, no, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> See what I'm up against? Where did you grow up? Um, well, I was born in Chester, Pennsylvania. 
And uh, I went graduated. to college in Chester, Pennsylvania. Yeah, so I was born in Chester, Pennsylvania, and, and all of my family are originally from Dutch country out in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, and Bird in hand? What does that mean? Bird, Bird in hand. hand. Well, so there, there's the, the names of the towns out there are a little off color. There's Bird in hand, there's intercourse, there's fellatio. Yeah, that's you're, all. You're that's right. all Amish country. Yeah. yeah, you're absolutely right. Well, um, my family and I are originally from a very small town called Ackland, Pennsylvania, uh, which is close to Parksburg. So if you've ever heard of Parksburg, and you know, when I was you know about seven or eight, um, my my mom uh, moved to New Jersey, moved to South Jersey, first effort, and then we ended up kind of landing in Lawnside, New Jersey, which Lawnside is the first. Um, incorporated African-American town in New Jersey. It was a stop on the Underground Railroad, and um, that's where I kind of spent the majority of my childhood. But interestingly, um, where I'm from in Lancaster County and, and um, you know, where my, my grandmom lives and my, my aunts, um, that is also quite historical um, and has a lot of history around it. My, like, great-great-great-grandfather um, won a land lottery in Lancaster, was a free black, Won a land lottery in Lancaster. So you can actually trace your lineage back to... 1690. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. And so he won this land lottery, purchased our, purchased this this plot of land in Lancaster County, and he part of it was a farm, and the other part became refuge for uh, runaway slaves who were coming across the Maryland-Pennsylvania border. Him and his brother were abolitionists, and as folks were coming across the border... They then gave them refuge on our family's uh, plot of land. Did he fight? Well, I would say anyone that's an abolitionist is fighting. Yeah, no, no, fight, no, no, yeah, no. That's a fighter right there. <laughs> the War of Secession. Did he Did he fight in the Civil War? Um, not my great-great-grandfather, but we have been able to trace back that um, members of my family, my ancestors, have fought in every American war. That's a, that's important because one of the things that people don't know is the the amount of northern black soldiers who were at great risk, more risk than being killed, fought in the Civil War because there was a there was a decree put out by the South that if any black individual who is caught fighting against the Confederacy will be repatriated into slavery, mm -hmm. whether you're yeah. a free man or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's a that's a it's it's not. It, <laughs> It's not only you're going to get shot at and have to fight, but if you get caught, you, you go back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and you're probably off better being killed. Yeah. Well, um, it's funny you say that because um, uh, I think it was his son fought. I'm not sure which. I can't remember which war, but there's newspaper clippings of the time where um, uh, I guess the, this would be like my great great grand uncle or something uh, was. Um, I don't know if it was like would be called a lawsuit at the time, but was suing the the government in order to get um, benefits um, because he was a soldier who was injured and um, he wasn't receiving medical benefits. Um, and so uh, he eventually won and, and did get um, some form of uh, payment from the government. But um, it just goes to show that during that time and, and, you know, even as we come contemporarily, you know, that black people have been the number one patriots <laughs> of of the U.S., but their fight for support um, well, has been deep and long. So the Civil War in general, mm -hmm. there's some mix-up about that. So if you read the, the autobiographies of uh, both Robert E. Lee and Ulysses S. Grant, which I've read, Robert E. Lee was a staunch abolitionist, but he was a Virginian, mm -hmm. so he had to fight for the South. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, Many soldiers are buried on a plot of land that was once owned by Robert E. Lee that was taken by the U.S. government because he didn't pay his taxes, and that's Arlington National Cemetery. Mm -hmm. all right? Now, Robert E. Lee's wife used to get in trouble all the time because she would teach slaves how to read. She would give them trades uh, because his belief, he knew, he knew slavery had to end. You can't be two things at once when it comes to slavery, right? You can't fight for, uh, you can't fight for the Confederacy and to keep systems of of oppression of black people slavery and and racism it is the economic foundation of this country and when it comes to even you know as you're talking of you know what his plans were where someone else's plans were it did it did not center and 
it didn't center the actual needs of black people, right? It's still within the lens of what a a white person of power thinks is best versus thinking about, wait, we're in a, we have created a system of deep injustice and violence and oppression. And why are we not thinking radically about change versus you know, slow and steady. No, change should be radical. Change should be radical. Change is, is a dangerous. It's a slippery slope. Well, radical change is tough because you're gonna get fight from everywhere. Correct. Radical, you know, it, like and, a, a gradual change. And listen, I'm not saying radical change is wrong or gradual change is wrong, but you make a radical change in anything, you're gonna get well, fights from let, every side. Let me bring it back to a current <laughs> argument that we can we can uh, relate to. So the gun laws are, and then listen, I'm not saying gun laws are bad or gun laws are good, but they changed, the, it was a radical change in gun laws where you couldn't have a magazine with, a 10 round, with 10 rounds in it. And it was radically done without thinking of the consequences of the actions. So half the police on the road were carrying illegal guns. Yeah. That's, that's, that's radical that's what it comes change. down to. It has to be, and it's painful, but it has to be well thought out when you make the, and that's what fear, that's my fear of radical change like that. And, you know, we're here to talk about inequity mm-hmm. more than anything else. And, and that's, it kind of plays into that a little bit. Yeah, when I, when I think of radical change and when I say radical, I'm thinking of thinking beyond what is comfortable for those in power, right? And so any change is challenging. Any change is uncomfortable. Any change there, there's going to, is going to be met with, it's going to be messy, right? Um, but... Because we are up against systems of deep historical oppression, it's unfortunate that the the words, the semantics of like, how do we create really good, meaningful change? Okay, I say radical, but it's just change, right? And thinking of how change should be implemented, whether that was during slavery, post antebellum, or even now, thinking about it more in the conditions of those who were most victimized by systems of oppression. It's radical for those who who aren't experiencing that, but for those that are inside of it, that are on the on the other side of oppress of oppressive systems, for them it's like this is just what's needed. But it's new for it's new for those who who don't experience. People that. People are living it, are feeling it. Exactly. You know, and exactly. people who aren't living it are are I don't want to say opposed to change, but they're not really living it day by day. It's tough, right? But that and that's what privilege is, right? all different forms of privilege, but when you have the comfort of not experiencing what are the challenges of a particular group, right, whether that is black people with disabilities, women, our immigrant population, right, when we don't, when we don't, when we have the privilege not to live in that reality, then we can create a story about what that reality is and and how changes can be implemented, right? Oh, let's do it slowly or let's do it this way. But those that are deeply in that experience need that change now. The, the problem with slow change is people are going to change their minds midway through that change. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I mean, everybody, you know, then they start thinking it through and the change doesn't really come the way they really intended it to be. I mean, historically in the U.S., we've seen we've seen deep moments of radical change. Right. But change that's necessary. Right. Um integration of of schools right okay is that radical okay yes maybe at the time wow we're, we're integrating our school systems but it's also needed change right so sometimes you just have to do it in order for what's right to occur all i all i caution people on the side of radical change is be is play chess not checkers so the whole concept behind chess is you have to think three or four moves ahead all right and that way you can guard against possibilities so if you think three or four moves ahead, no matter what you do, and I teach my kids chess for this reason. So if you do this, well, here's three possible consequences that could come your way. And unfortunately, a lot of times the radical chess, a lot of radical change comes from playing checkers and not chess because you start to see, and, and getting back to the, to the slave thing, it's, you, it's kind of inhumane to put somebody just out on their own without a, a plan in place. Well, here's the other thing, too, which is what we see, which is why the work we do at Coalition is about equity, right? Is that part of understanding inequity, part of understanding 
systems that have created, uh, uh, that have marginalized folks, that have uh, removed resources and necessary, necessary resources and supports for folks and so on and so forth, is that we have a tendency in this society to put the responsibility on the individual. To say if we if we skill you up if we if you do if you learn these skills if you do this then you'll be able to matriculate and assimilate into what is the what is the the culture and society now instead of saying at a broader viewpoint right how are the current systems institutions resources entities groups how have they created a situation that is not helpful for this individual. So even if this person is super skilled up, even if this person you know, has all the things they need individually, it doesn't take into consideration that they're always going to hit a ceiling that is a, a, a ceiling of, of, of racism. It's like they sexism. put a cap on it. Yeah. So that's part of what, what we do and, and how we think about things at the coalition is that, yeah, somebody could could be have all the motivation that they need. Somebody can have five different degrees. Somebody can have, you know, all the different um, money and, and, and education or whatever, but we still live in a society that is going to limit someone's ability to live a full and healthy life because of how that benefits the larger powerful systems, right? And so I definitely hear you when you're when you're saying, hey, like, you know, chestnut checkers, or and in my mind, I just call that being intentional. But thinking about thinking strategically about how do you create, how can you help someone be able to help themselves? Part of equity is meeting meeting that individual more than halfway, realizing that society as a whole doesn't have everything in place to to be supportive. That's a interesting concept. Meeting somebody halfway. Well, I think more than halfway, but yeah. Okay, meet, meeting somebody halfway. Mm-hmm. You, that's, you just touched on something that's super, super important. It's teaching a man to fish will feed him for a lifetime. Giving a man a fish will feed him for a day. If you meet somebody halfway where you give them fish, but you, t- you teach them how to fish at the same time, that's the, that's the power behind it. And that's where our two ideologies, which, which may be different, and that's mm-hmm. good, but that's where our two ideologies can meet in the middle. And that's the important thing, to meet in the middle. You have your way, I have my way. Neither of us are right, I hate to tell you. Neither of us are right. Somewhere in the middle, that's in that gray area. Wouldn't, that's wouldn't where we're that right. solve most of the world's problems if we met, met in the middle or maybe a little past the middle? I agree. I think that um, I think that because many folks aren't living in the reality of what so many people who are experiencing so many different challenges, right? Poverty, food insecurity, housing insecurity, because they're not living in that situation, homelessness, then it's hard for them to understand how, what, what the middle or past the middle looks and feels like, right? So when we're talking about it from a position of not being in that experience, particularly nowadays, right? we're not taking into consideration what is the true lived experience of people who are experiencing all forms of of challenge and inequity. I would say, okay, yeah, we can teach a man to fish, right? And that that man and that or that person um, knows the skill of fishing. But if there's not a lake around, there ain't shit that they can do. If they don't have anywhere to put that fish or cook that fish uh, after they've had this wonderful skill of getting it, then we haven't helped them. But part of the work that we should be doing is thinking about all of that. What are all the reasons and conditions why somebody could have what they need as a skill, right? But there's there's not a lake. Sam there's can, not there's not have, storage. You have no there's, way to work with that skill. Sam, after you, after you do after you use that skill, you have no way. Sam exactly. Sam Kinnison used to have a great joke about this. <laughs> So we were dumping at the time he was telling the joke. We were dumping millions into like the Somalia area and stuff with starving children and things like that. Know exactly where you're going. And with this. he used to say instead of dumping because they were dumping mil like billions of dollars into this. He goes, "Why don't we just rent them all U-Hauls, teach them how to drive, and get them to places where there are food?" It's sand. It's sand. It's or you sand. can't grow anything. You know, it was a, it was a funny way to to roundabout say what you're saying. Mm-hmm. Give them give them 
teach them to fish, give them a fish, but also take them where there's a lake, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So you, well, wow, this, this is going off the rails here. <laughs> it is. Going just just rails. getting back to what you were saying. It's, you know, the old saying, you know, walk a mile in my shoes. I always say, you know, yeah. see life through my eyes. Mm-hmm. So if, if someone saw life through someone, you know, through someone else's eyes, they may actually grasp the reality exactly. of what's going on. But exactly. see, but that, that's judging a book by its cover. So if you were to see, I've been all three of those things. Mm-hmm. I've been poor. Mm-hmm. I've been homeless. Mm-hmm. I've been, I, I believe it or not, I've been looked down on mm-hmm. all three of them. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the that same was, time. That was just today. Yeah. <laughs> That's the, the danger of it. You, you look at a, a certain type of people, a certain race of people, a certain gender of people, somebody who, is not, do, do, who is not, doesn't look exactly like you, and you judge them based on the, their appearance. Um, you would never think that I was ever homeless, but I was. All right? You would never think that I was ever poor. I grew up very poor. Um, I know what the inequity is of life. Now you grew up in that South Jersey area in that community. When did you first start to, you know what, you know what I did forget? I forgot our social media question. All right. <laughs> we got this far without even. Yeah. But I do want to say that, you know, I have had the awesome experience of working with supporting meeting so many different types of people. So I don't judge books by their cover. I think that's even more of why we're able to have impact in this work is because we realize that struggle is looks different, right? Suffering. 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 Come on, Doc. There's, there's, promote the podcast. What's your cheese? I'm sorry, but <laughs> there's, there's a lot of different faces and experiences to what suffering is, right? But everybody doesn't hold that particular frame, right? Mm. And so we know, hey, someone that is experiencing food insecurity or someone who is experiencing homelessness, um, there's a diversity to how they look, right? How they experience that and also all the different types of resources they might need, right? Um, We know statistically that there's some groups that experience food insecurity, homelessness at higher rates, higher prevalence than others. Poverty. And poverty at higher rates than others. But at the end of the day, we know inside of, of all of that is a diversity of folks. And that's how we have to, that's how we have to lean and work in. Um, and so I, me personally, I don't, you know, I, I don't know where people have come from, you know. <laughs> um, and I'll but s- I do know where we met for the first time. Because they're one of our newest sponsors, and that's Three Acres Properties in Jersey City. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> Listen, they yeah, they're they're they've been really good to us. And actually, somebody from that location gave us our social media question. And our okay. social media question is: How did your early career choices lead to lead you to where you are now? Because it kind of works into this to the conversation now. You have this view of food inequity, food and health inequity. Mm-hmm. It, it, this doesn't just happen overnight. No. So how did that? How did your your past experiences lead you to where you are now? Mm-hmm. Gosh, that's such a big. That's a big it's question. Broad. It's broad. Well, that's uh, blame three acres. Don't blame me. <laughs> <laughs> that's a big question. <laughs> um, so where where do I where do I start? I'll say I'll say first. Uh, well, you were a professor. At I was Temple. a professor, but I but right before we get to the professor, right? This is what I'll say. Up until, you know, um, getting my bachelor's degree in psychology, I wanted to be a forensic psychologist, right? I was also an athlete. I've been an athlete my entire life. I went to Fairleigh Dickinson University. Yes. Track and field. Go Devils. <laughs> well, it's the Knights under Hackensack no, campus. No, it's but, Madison uh, Devils. I, don't, I won't hold that against you. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, Bergen County. Well, they didn't have a football team in Teaneck Hackensack campus. You didn't have one either. Yeah, we did. Yes, ECACs. Did. Yeah. We had a really good one. Yeah. Well, didn't think but, um, that good anyway, but uh but you know, my up and up and through my getting my bachelor's degree, I, I wanted to be a forensic psychologist. Um I was so, so, so um like absorbed and focused on the psychology of sociopaths, the the psychology of serial killers, I should say. That I wanted to, I felt like at the time I wanted to c- devote my career to understanding serial killers, but particularly also understanding individuals who perpetrated sexual violence. Um, and so, go through my hey, bachelor's. Doc, 
Here's your next case study. No, no, no. Just, Here's your next. No. I, I beat no. you to the punch. You, you know did. it. That time you did. <laughs> it's a first for everything. No, but um, but then up and through my master's degree, my master's degree is in psychology with a, a focus on forensics. Um, I was taking a profiling serial rapist class. I still find understanding. That's a the, joyful class. Yeah, I still yeah, no I still kidding. find um, understanding the mind of a serial rapist and rapists in general fascinating and necessary. It was taught by a retired New York City detective, and he would show us actual uh, crime scene photos. Crime scene photos, mm. and we would. A lot of the focus was on victimology. Why this victim? Right. One day I'm in class. I'm looking up. We're looking at crime scene photos, and I said to myself, I could do this for about five to seven years. I do this about five to seven years to still be a happy, okay person, adjusted person. Sounds like it might take a piece of your soul, though, doing but that. But that was exactly, exactly why I said, you know what? But when it gets, when, once I'd get to around the 10-year mark, I would be a different person. Um, and so at the same time, I was a college athlete, did pole vault and discus. And I had suffered from competitive sport anxiety. As a discus thrower, I was super confident. But as a pole vaulter... I would get so nervous. I would have catastrophizing thoughts, all these different things. And so at the same time, I went to my advisor and I said, you know, I'm experiencing this as an athlete. And he said, oh, there's people called sports psychologists that work with athletes who, are experience, who experience a range of different issues or concerns related to sport and performance. And so God bless my, my thesis committee at FDU. They said, look, you still got to graduate with your degree in the specialization in forensics. But we'll let you do a master's thesis on something related to sports psychology. And so I did my master's thesis on the motivation and confidence within um, amongst student athletes and and how does anxiety impact, you know, an athlete's uh, motivation. So I graduate and then I say, you know what, I'm going to I think I'm going to go get this degree in, in kinesiology and sports psychology. Didn't really know anything about it because, again, my whole life had been forensics. Really didn't know anything about sports. Science. And I couldn't spell kinesiology. <laughs> um, <laughs> right now, the palm is going to scratch his head going. <laughs> Another um, word for the palm is and still Catastrophizing and <laughs> kinesiology. Um, but I didn't know anything about it. And I Googled some, some schools. Temple University popped up. And to make a long story short, I met the most wonderful man in the world who's still my mentor today, Dr. Michael Sachs. I thought I was the most amazing person she ever met. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he took a chance on me because, you know, many, many students and kids that come into sports psychology know sports psych. And I, I knew clinical psychology. I knew forensics. And so he said, you know what? I'm going to take a, a, a bet on you. At the same time, I was like, look, I want to know more about this thing called sport and exercise psychology. But plus sign, I also began to become deeply fascinated in the health issues, the preventative health and chronic health issues that I observed in my own family. Um, Many of the women in my family um, experienced cancer, diabetes, um, uh, and other lupus, sickle cell anemia. And so I just wondered, is there a relation, a relationship between what I experienced in my family, even with myself, and physical activity and exercise? And so during my time at Temple, I looked into a lot of different motivation theories, a lot of sociology of physical activity, as well as psychology of physical activity, to further kind of peel back, why might there be a higher prevalence of these preventable chronic illnesses amongst black women? And how might understanding the sociology and psychology of physical activity in some way be helpful in changing those trends? And so my research and my work as a professor focused a lot on that, the social determinants of physical activity, particularly in black and brown women. At the same time, you know, I've been in, I've, I was at a bunch of different schools and at Long Island University, um, I had started a center that really focused on that research, but also provided sport and exercise psychology services to the community. So that's really That's the gist of what got me into health and wellness. But it makes perfect sense because I I was uh, been a runner for quite some time now. You wouldn't notice. (laughs) (laughs) And you're also an extreme meditator. I am. Yeah, I am. I'm an extreme meditator. It's either hot or cold, depending on the season. Mm -hmm. Now it's cold. Mike stands out back watching me in my underwear. 
I got um, pictures. Yeah. But so you take a marathon runner. The typical marathon diet is especially pre race is has always been the pasta party. Pasta before. the night before. The pasta party be, is a big night before the New York City Marathon. I went to it mm-hmm. in 2006. Mm-hmm. Carbohydrates, especially starchy carbohydrates for, for a runner, is probably the worst thing you could possibly do. Mm-hmm. Just to give you an example, every marathon I've ever run, excuse my language here, but somebody always messes their pants. At the 18-mile mark. No, right off the gate. Right off the gate, there's a bathroom. So New York City Marathon starts at the Verrazano Arizona. Bridge. The bathroom, the bathroom line is, it, it's so many Porta Johns you wouldn't you wouldn't believe it. Somebody inevitably will mess their pants. Mm-hmm. Now, as ultra elite marathoners get older, the old ones, they would they would be plagued by chronic gut issues, mm-hmm. chronic arthritis, mm-hmm. which is all brought on by say gluten because mm-hmm. our bodies aren't supposed to process it. What they're finding now is. Um, a diet that's high in good fats mm-hmm. will give you better fuel mm-hmm. than than a carbohydrate rich diet. Mm-hmm. For marathon runners, now once they switch their diet, they're able to run faster, further, and longer. Mm-hmm. A marathon runner, especially an elite marathon runner's career, would end about 31, 32, mm-hmm. 33, maybe. Now they're they're going into their forties, mm-hmm. all because of that health and wellness change in sports. I guess it's, it's it's as much psychology as is sports, health, and wellness. Mm-hmm. So it makes perfect sense to me. Mm-hmm. Um, have you experienced anything like that as far as dietary issues, changes that you saw there was a problem as far as an athlete? As far as an athlete, the ones, uh, the ones, that, you've, the uh, ones that you've coached. Well, I haven't coached anyone. Not coached, but talked to. <laughs> worked with. Worked, worked with. <laughs> lectured. During... Uh, during my time um, at LIU when we had Peak Center and we were providing sports psychology services to athletes, um, which is actually just one of the reasons why I just love what I do, but um, it was not uncommon for an athlete to come in for support around a particular performance-related issue. Let's say they, you know, the coach said you're, 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 there's an issue with confidence or you know, competitive sport anxiety. And then when we begin to peel back some of the layers of that athlete's daily experience, we find out, well, they're, they don't have enough money to, to eat, right? They're experiencing, they're experiencing food insecurity or they're, they're sleepless at night um, or they're experiencing challenges at home or something like that, which all impact their ability to perform at their most optimal, right? Particularly... Uh, not just food insecurity, but also having access to the right type of diet for their body and for their the physical needs and, uh, that they have for their sport. So food education. Food education and food access, right? Well, food access is fast food. Food access is access to food. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm saying I'm saying the, the easiest access to food is generally fast food. Yeah, and you know, so you're eating McDonald's burgers and going out and running and you know. Which yeah. it's counterintuitive. Not it's not helpful. Um, and that all still comes with an expense at the same time, right? And so something that I observed with the particularly the student athletes, the college level athletes, was that access to healthy food options and to food in general, regular consistent food, right? Um, was a problem. Was a problem. Um, which we know that there's populations of co- college kids, I don't know the exact statistic, that experience food insecurity every day, right? And so that just because you're a student athlete doesn't mean you're not immune to that as well. But then also, yeah, education around, you know, when you do have access to the the food options that you need, you know, what are the best foods for you to eat, not just for your sport, but for that time, that phase or that season that you're in, um, as well as outside of uh, of season, yeah. Well, the, I, I have to say that is the longest answer to a social media question we've ever had. Probably, <laughs> <laughs> probably. You know what? Yeah. I'm going to give Dr. Just, Legia yeah, a break. Has... <laughs> I'm going to give her a break. I'm going to pass that portion of the social media question <laughs> off to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what was it again? Could you? Re- oh, were, we, were we still in the social media question? <laughs> well, we we went round about. We went did around. I, did I answer the social yes, media question? Yes, you did. Question? Yes, about, you did. About fifty-two you... times. <laughs> 
your <laughs> early career choices leading to where you are now? You know, I, I mean, my my first career after I, I left college was I got into uh, the Pipe Fitters Union, and it showed me what hard work is all about. I knew you worked with pipe. Yeah, exactly. I laid pipe for a long time. I knew it. Um, no, it, it, it taught me what hard work was all about, you know, yeah. and, and, you know, you didn't have vacation days. Mm. You know, you didn't have holidays. You either worked or you didn't work. You know, you were paid by the hour. If there was a holiday, you didn't get paid that day. If you didn't, you know, if you didn't want to go to work one day, you didn't get paid that day. Mm. So it, it taught me how to apply myself, um, work hard in all elements, hot, cold, you know, everything. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where I really got my work ethic from. I mean, I've been retired for over six years now and I'm working every day. I just can't sit still and stop working. Mm -hmm. My early on jobs made me enjoy hard work mm -hmm. maybe enjoy it and i miss it mm -hmm. i miss being able you, to you didn't work hard at coldwell toyota who are you kidding what about putting up swimming pools and doing construction since i was yeah. 13 i enjoyed that type of work because mm -hmm. you, it fulfills you mm -hmm. you go home tired sweaty exhausted you feel accomplished at the end yeah. of the day mm -hmm. that's what i said that work in all elements that's what that's what working in a, you know in a construction union did for me as much as i loved being a cop on those nights when nothing happened, <laughs> I went home more tired and, and almost less fulfilled, less fulfilled, almost depressed that I wasn't able to do anything. Mm -hmm. Like you're, you're sort of governed, you're held back. Mm -hmm. And I don't like that feeling. Mm -hmm. So what do I do? You know, I just, I take the opportunity when I have downtime to go work harder. I'll, uh, I'll fill up time to, I'm, I'm a workaholic, unfortunately, but I will always find that, something to fill that gap because I know that fulfillment of a, of a hard day's work. Mm -hmm. And I think it's something that we as a society have gotten very, very far away from. But getting back to the education thing that you, you talked about earlier, I see this, I see this in my community because I'm, I'm a football coach mm -hmm. and I see this with little kids. So you, you have a little kid and we got weight limits and their, their parents are uneducated or maybe uh, they, they're not economically able to get the better foods mm -hmm. or they just don't know. Mm -hmm. I found that in education is probably the worst mm -hmm. out of anything. So you get a kid who's on the border with weight limit and he come, you know, you get him on the scale a week later and he's gained weight. I was like, what happened? He says, well, what'd you, I said, what'd you have for dinner? He said, I had chicken. I'm like, well, that's good. And then I'm like, wait, how's the chicken cook? Well, <laughs> it, it was Kentucky fried chicken. Love that chicken from Popeyes. <laughs> I said, okay, um, yeah, fried chicken is not the best health choice that you can make. Okay, and then then you have to go talk to the parents and I say, okay, let's 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 figure this out because I want the kid to play. Mm -hmm. And then you you from the limited uh, limited knowledge that I have about food, I tried to say, well, stick to these, stick here, do this, do this, do this, stay away from pasta, stay away from bread, uh, meats, or if you're vegan because. There was, there was a couple of them that were vegan. Let's stay away from anything fried with with uh, vegetable oil. Stay away from that stuff. Anything to give them a leg up. Mm -hmm. um, but that's the inequity of education as far as food goes. And that goes across the board. I see this a lot in the inner cities. Mm -hmm. You go down the inner cities, you go down to any inner city, what do you see? You see fast food. You see a bodega. Um, usually a strip club mm -hmm. or a bar. Liquor stores. And that's, it's cheap, easy food. Mm -hmm. And now pharmacies. And ph ph uh, <laughs> you know, we'll, you know, we'll pump, you know, you know, poor food options into communities, right? Knowing that a healthy diet is one, pre a huge preventative strategy and tactic um, to eliminating or reducing the prevalence of things like obesity, stroke, heart heart disease. But instead of doing that, we pump that we pump that food into various different communities and then say when you get to the point where you're experiencing God. this illness, we'll give exactly. you some form of pharma yep. pharmaceutical to manage it. If you One get this shop. Just, yeah, if you get this just go to the local drugstore exactly. and yeah, exactly. Instead of and that that's how money is made. I was right? just going to say it's all that, about this. It's all about money. And instead of in investing in prevention, right, 
prevention. Now, people are going to lose money, but we'll have healthier communities. We'll have healthier people. We'll have we'll have individuals that know, not only have access to what they need, but also know how to prepare that food. And because it's this and, world, and, this, and this, this country's run all about the almighty buck, mm-hmm. right? And they're looking at angles to make more money. You do have so, to follow the money. So you pump, you pump them all with the wrong kinds of food and everything else. So they do come down with all these different, you know, ailments and illnesses mm-hmm. and then you push them off to the local drugstore and everybody makes money mm-hmm. Asi- but they're not looking out for me and you is mm-hmm. really what it comes down to mm-hmm. As- aside from the obvious health risks of poor food choices there are some secondary uh, I-, I don't know the proper proper term for it but there are there are some secondary effects to it because I do know your behavior, is directly correlated to what you eat. Mm-hmm. Now, if you talk to any teacher who teaches in the inner cities, mm-hmm. and I hate to—I'm not ragging on the inner cities, but because it happens in the suburbs too. But it's—it's it's, it, there's a higher concentration in the inner cities where the kids are very bis- very poorly behaved, mm-hmm. and that has a correlation to garbage food going in, garbage in, garbage out. Mm-hmm. And I know, so I don't know if you ever watched that documentary, Super Size Me. Yeah. I have. So inside that, there was these little little vignettes of documentaries in there and they were talking about a uh like a reform school Mm -hmm. where they brought in a uh an outside company to provide them with healthier food Mm -hmm. and they watched their behavior change overnight Mm -hmm. do you think that's something do you think there's any merit to that um i think a couple of things i think one um one geography that gets left out the conversation around food access and food security uh, are rural communities and food apartheidism, food deserts um, certainly exist in our in our very rural communities as well. Amish country, they they've got to grow what they eat. That's just a tough life. <laughs> Lancaster, <laughs> How, the grocery store is four miles away by horse. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Uh, but um, so I'll, that's one thing. But the second is that when it comes to uh, access to healthy food options consistent access to fe- healthy food options and options that, you know, someone needs to, to, to grow and be strong. What we know is that when it comes to children, a child who is experiencing food insecurity, it is going to, uh, what's the word that I want to use? It has a direct impact to their socio-emotional and cognitive development, right? Wow. If you're not she, getting... She's going to blow De Palma's mind <laughs> okay. with that sentence right I, there. When he listens to this, you're going to be hear, able to hear his head explode. <laughs> his lips going to hit the floor. <laughs> so when a child doesn't have number one access to regular a regular consistent diet, right, then it's not going to allow their 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 body, their brain to develop in the most healthy and strong way. So that's just first consistency to 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 options, let alone healthy food options. But then also healthy food options, right, that we know would markedly help um, in just the the space of preventative health, right? You know, just being able to live a healthy life and also have what you need, not putting in refined, overly refined food and things like that, which um, there's studies out there that um, show that, unfortunately, um, food options here in the States that have a lot of refined uh, elements in it and things like that. Processed are, food. Processed food are designed to trigger the pleasure centers of the brain, right? Exactly. Addictive. So yes, yes, somewhere in the 60s, the food companies realized that I can get people to eat more food more frequently by increasing the amount of processed materials in there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> so it's crazy. Yeah, so with... These overprocessed foods, overprocessed, you know, um, food items, fast food from your fast food to your Oreo cookies, right? They're, they're cheap too. They're cheap, right? They might last a little bit longer for depending on what the the item is, but also the science behind how they're created is tricking our brain, right, to get happy, get happy and get comfortable, right, immediately and become sedentary will become sedentary or just continue to access and get eat those things versus um, helping 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 our society, helping people eat healthier options that aren't designed to trigger those pleasure centers and instead allow your body's hormones to tell it, hey, I'm eating and I'm full and I don't need anything else, right? 
So there's, there's a science behind all of this. There's there's one thing, Dr. Carter, that it, people are going to listen to this and everybody's going to agree with mm-hmm. exactly what you're saying. Mm-hmm. But I guarantee somebody sitting out there and go, well, you know what? I'd love to eat healthier, but Whole Foods is freaking expensive. And that's a very, very, very real thing. Yeah, Food is expensive, right? Food is expensive. And then let alone Whole food, um, whole a whole foods market, but then also even or organic food, right? So let's just even talk about the economics of food. You know, when we say, hey, yeah, eat healthier, if someone goes out and buys a bag of kale, they're going to have to eat that kale within two days, yeah. right? Which then just from a weekly desire of wanting to bring more kale into your diet, we've now increased the cost for that family to eat healthier, right? So there has to be very meaningful conversation around food cost if we want to engage in preventative health strategies just around nutrition, right? Well, there's so we've we've touched on on so many different issues here. Mm-hmm. We're t- we touched about the psychology behind behind food. We touched about the health issues behind food. We touched about the economics behind food. And these are all this is a very broad problem you're tackling here. Mm-hmm. It's like a huge broad problem. That's why I'm busy. You guys said I had to turn my phone off. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, my, my my thing is the ever changing idea of food. Like we we talked about it before, the food pyramid. So yes, we, right. We, we talked we were about younger, that. yeah. And, and we we talk. I mean, it, it's come up. Back in the day, they used to say that egg whites was great for you, and, and don't eat the yolk and all that stuff. Now they say the yolk is good for you. I mean, it's, so it's ever changing. You know, and no, you never know what's right and what's wrong anymore. Mm. Have you ever heard the term "breakfast is the most important meal of the day"? Of yeah. course. Do you know who started that? Who? Yeah. McDonald's Charles, <laughs> or egg companies? Charles Kellogg. Yeah, Kellogg cereal, mm-hmm. which was it was designed to sell more cereal. Mm-hmm. Which he, the reason he I don't know if you know the story about it. The reason he decide he designed Kellogg's cornflakes was to he thought food had a direct correlation with sexual behavior, and he wanted to curb sexual behavior. So he figured bland food would curb sexual behavior. It's a really interesting guy. Strange, really, really strange. But he, uh, that's that's so that food pyramid in the fifties and sixties was created by companies, just the same way the dairy industry mm-hmm. inundates. We don't need dairy. Our bodies don't need. Yeah, it's good. Milk is good, but we don't need dairy past infancy. We're one of the only creatures on the planet that drink milk after infancy. Mm-hmm. But the dairy, you know. Vi- good in vitamin D. It's not a good source of vitamin D. Mm-hmm. Does milk really make your bones stronger? No. <laughs> you got to drink a like you got to drink a vat of milk <laughs> before you get the proper vitamin D in it. So it's those advertisers, and they're all chasing the money, and they want to sell their product. Where you're kind of going against the grain. You got an uphill battle with your nonprofit. Mm-hmm. The- well, you know, my my dad. One of the last things my dad told me before he died was, "You're tough." So <laughs> <laughs> that's what I- he said. Lead you, you're tough. <laughs> and, and strong-willed, I can say that. <laughs> so let's. So how are you, Doctor Leija Carter, mm-hmm. going to change this? That's the beauty of the of Coalition for Food and Health Equity. Um, the one of the the magic, I should say, around Coalition for Food and Health Equity is that no great thing can be done alone, and that's why it's called the coalition. And so, how are we going to play our part in? transforming what health should look like, what wellness opportunities should look like, first we tap into the technology of community. And what that means is that looking at things from an economic framework. I was going to say, is it community specific? Um, it's wherever we land in the community, yeah. you know. But looking at things, when we're talking about food insecurity, um, exercise apartheid, um, access to mental health services, all these things that integrate to help someone live healthy we don't want to put a band-aid on any one thing we want to get to the root of the issue and the root of it is economic inequity economic injustice right how are what are the causes and the conditions that are constantly recreating a system and an environment where people don't have what they need to to live healthy and whole lives so for us at the coalition We look at this through an economic, a microeconomic framework, meaning tapping into our local neighborhoods, right, our local small businesses, and converting them into being what I like to call change makers in health. Telling a small business owner, 
you know, you're an entrepreneur, you, you've got this cafe or you've got this studio or whatever, but how about we bring you into a culture or a community of helping to transform what health looks like in your, just even in your block, right? So we work with local small businesses and have them come in to be change makers in health with us to help then connect the, particularly with uh, restaurants, the healthy food that is on their menu, right? Well, McDonald's did that. They put a salad on their menu. Yeah. Do you know the only the only two things on the McDonald's but, menu that don't this, have sugar or the McNuggets and the fries? But see, this is not mm-hmm. about having one option, right? Because for us, we want we're addressing one of the things we're addressing is food insecurity, and we see there's a whole population of folks that don't have what they need every day to live a healthy life and and to, or to have the food that they need regularly, right? And so, one. One aspect of the work that we do is we say, hey, let's work with our small businesses, our local restaurants. They create pretty much menus that we approve. We, we work with our nutritionists that we approve um, that then are delivered to the doorsteps of anyone that's enrolled in our free meal subscription program. So that way they have access and they're, they're getting healthy food options, healthy pre-made food options from a local restaurant. That's also catered to their medical needs. And that's the thing here. Because, yeah, we could just throw salad, right, to everyone or brown rice or whatever. But if someone, you know, is pre-diabetic or if someone has a particular medical condition, that's not helpful for them, right? And that's also when we're getting to, like, what does true equity look like? It looks like giving people what they need in the way in which they need it, right? Now, a couple of our other programs, one of our other programs, we say, let's take it a bit further, right? And try to make food and wellness services a corner, like a like on your corner option. And so with our community fridges that we have and, and other things that we're doing with our community fridges, it then invites folks to say, look, you could enroll in our program. We, we deliver those meals to you. Or you can go to one of our refrigerators and take what you want without any questions. No questions asked. Just take what you want. Tell right? me where these are. I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any in the sounds, Pompton Plains area? Sounds delicious. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have four right now. We have uh, one in uh, St. Luke's Church. We're launching tomorrow. St. Luke's um, uh, Baptist Church in Patterson, uh, New Jersey. We have one in Mount Pilgrim um, Church's Food Pantry um, in Passaic. Uh, we have one at NJCRI in Newark in their Crossroads facility, which is a uh, a, a drop-in facility for, for folks, particularly folks experiencing homelessness. Um, to come in and get a variety of services, and now they can come and get, you know, healthy food options. So and then on, also on, in on, Jersey City at, on, at Hudson Pride Center on December twenty fourth, we'll be in Patterson. Uh, we're going to stop by. Maybe we we'll got to get by. that address for you. you. You should come with us. It is at two sixty nine Fair Street. Write that down. Yeah, two sixty nine Fair Street. Fair. I'm just going to I'm going to tell Blue Magazine stop there when we're giving our presents. At St. Luke Baptist Church's uh, food pantry, food and giving pantry, um, and so. For us, the magic behind what we do is, hey, we could, we certainly could make healthy pre-made meals and deliver it at, or give it to folks or, or just give salads to everyone. But one, we need to tap into the local microeconomy, our local businesses, help them build their capacity, help them do, help them kind of reinvest back into the community, right, financially, um, while also then providing a diversity of food options for folks that are involved in our program. By doing this, and then we also partner with community agencies and things, by doing this, we are kind of reshaping what community looks like through an economic framework, right? Because I could, I could make a bunch of macaroni and cheese or something, like from my house, but how is that helping the local economy? So we have to kind of pump resources, financial resources, into the local economy so that way it begins to kind of build up in, in that capacity in that way while also plus sign addressing food insecurity for somebody that's in immediate need. Well, don't do you, don't tell me mac and cheese is bad because that's one of my that's favorites. That's one of the worst things ever. Don't, I'm not going to cast judgment. Yeah. <laughs> how do you how do you build a framework <laughs> of sustainability around these these healthy options? Yes, it's great that people can go in there and get a healthy food option because I love that. You know, it's it's all about making good choices. You can make good choices in these pharmacies and CVS and Walgreens. You can go in there and instead of the Snickers bar, you grab a bag of nuts or something. It's a better choice. It might not be the best choice, but it's a better choice. Uh, how do you create a sustainable mindset with these folks? Do you educate them? Do you tell them, oh, look, just 
eat this food and tell me how you feel. Does it feel better? What What's your plan on that? Um, well, there's a couple of answers to your question. I mean, the first, when it comes to our community fridges, our Ujama community fridges, uh, the beauty of that is that it's also leveraging technology in order to advance both food and nutritional security, but then also other forms of health needs. It's, we have a, a couple new programs coming out. Um, but within the refrigerators, uh, the refrigerators are super cool. They're basically a big computer. And all the food items that are placed in that refrigerator have digital tags on them that the refrigerator sensors pick up. That information goes to the front of the kiosk that's on that refrigerator, as well as to an open website. So folks can kind of surf and shop the fridge and learn specifically about what is what are the nutritional components of the food items in that refrigerator. But they can also go to the open website and say, hey, you know, there's a refrigerator close by to me and I am gluten free. Right. And they can look at all the gluten free options that are currently in that fridge that we just restocked currently in that fridge to really learn more about it. When it comes to our hunger project, a lot of different things. I mean, our hunger project program really provides much more custom pre-made meals to folks enrolled. And so when we're learning about the client and then being responsive to the client's needs and how we dispatch meals to them weekly. So that's one. Many clients are referred to us from their doctors, um, from an, another social service agency. So there is a hey, you know, I heard about your program um, and, you know, maybe I'm diabetic or pre-diabetic. I'm also experiencing food insecurity and maybe housing insecurity or something like that. But I want to be able to eat better, but I, I, don't, I can't afford it. And so what our program does is help alleviate many of those challenges. It provides you that healthy food option that you need to, to individuals involved and also addresses that um, food insecurity and that nutritional insecurity. So folks are, they have um, access to the menu of food items and the nutritional components in those food, in those food items. Um, going into 2023, we will be bringing on a nutrition educator that can work with individuals within our program, even if it's just to help them learn a little bit more about what they're eating and if they can, if they might have the, the um, resources to maybe replicate some of the foods that they're, that they're eating. Um, because what I found, especially people of, of, lower economic status, they want to give their kids the best. Like mm -hmm. they, the parents especially, they want to give their kids the best to give them that, that little leg up. Mm -hmm. in but life. they don't have the means to do it. Correct. Or they don't have the education to do it. It's one or the other. They don't have the economic I ability or education. I think things can be a both, right? I think that, but, you know, education is a very big, broad idea, right? The more that you know, at least me, I, I tell people all the time, I, I have four degrees. And what I, the, the more educated I've become, the more I realize I don't know, right? <laughs> that's what education is. It's realizing you <laughs> the don't. The more you learn, the more you don't. Exactly. You, the, the more you learn, the more you know you don't know. Ex that's Exactly. That's You're Socrates. Like, yeah. And so. It's, it, it, Socrates said, the only thing that you should know, learn in this life is that you know nothing. Mm -hmm. But I say that to say that when we use the, when we say education, that's such a kind of like monolithic big term because someone can know a, could know a reasonable amount about one particular thing when it comes to food and nutrition and not something else, right? And so it's really about what do folks need and what might they not have the resources and access to to be able to do the things for them, right? And yes, certainly even access to like something around like, you know, what's what's a good salad to eat for me or or if someone is diabetic or pre-diabetic, what is a, a, a diet that they should adopt? Even having knowing where they can find that information in order to read it and to to learn is also a barrier for well, many folks. Well, that's something important with those kiosks that you were telling me about. They have access to that information. It's their choice whether they choose to use it, but at least it's available to them. Mm -hmm. You're making, you're putting it in front of their face. And what we found, what we found with our refrigerators is that uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, at one of our refrigerated locations. Um, an individual said, you know, they had been wanting to to move to more of a meatless diet, uh, ve go vegetarian or vegan, and they were also they also are experiencing homelessness. Um, and so, they a vegan homeless person. Wow, that might be a first I've ever heard that. It's not the first that I have. <laughs> the first I've ever heard that. I'm De not kidding you. Definitely not the first. We have we have many many folks who are unhoused or homeless who are vegetarian or vegan, and because of the programming that we do through our hunger project in Ujamaa. We can, we can provide them 
the type of meals that are reasonable and necessary for how they eat. So they, regardless of the other struggles that they're experiencing, they can at least, if they're a vegan, then they, can, they we, we will make you vegan food. If you're vegetarian, vegetarian food, all the things. It shouldn't be that because you're experiencing one thing, you have to automatically experience something else, right? Um, even though we're trying to work to, you know, help dismantle these other areas of, of challenge. But in any case, um, the story that this individual said, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm trying to go meatless and didn't have access to the food options to be able to do that because he wanted to live healthier. And he said, now that we have the refrigerator, he comes there, you know, in the morning for breakfast, gets, you know, his, his vegan gluten-free oats, you know, and then lunch gets his, you know, vegan vegetarian options. And so it's allowing him in a way that is dignified, that is caring and on his terms, eat in the way that it's good and right while also, you know, tackling the other challenges that they're experiencing. That's the other thing with coalition is that we believe in dignity, dignity and care, that everything that we do, the messaging, the branding, how we place things, we we wanted to be wrapped in care and love, right? We don't believe, hey, I'm just going to throw some, you know, um, you know, a, a canned good at you or something like that. We we want you, we want to say, okay, what what do you like to eat, right? What is good for you? And let's package it also. The delivery of our meals are packaged with love, right? So we want, at the end of the day, people to know that there's at least one organization out there that cares for them. And food is one way, amongst other ways, that we show how we care. Um, I, I think dignity is a good word when it comes to this, too. Mm-hmm. You know, people, they don't want to, they may be overweight. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and they don't want someone to tell them how to eat, you know, and it, it's almost, I don't want to say against their dignity, but they're almost afraid to come out and say, I don't know how to eat right. Mm-hmm. But also think about how the, the messaging around body, right? That if your body doesn't look a particular way or if it's not a certain type, then. Just then, like that. Then, you just got to point to it. <laughs> Poor diet makes hair, increases hair loss. That's why so I got know. a hat on. Yeah. But but even but even the messaging and the narratives and the larger discourse around, you know, that the ideal body type should look a certain way, right? Uh, for men body or shaming. For, or for body shaming, right? Um, but, and then let alone, you know, wanting to support someone who is overweight or obese, this layer, the psychology around just how they might have experienced their body, people speaking to them, right? The stigma around that is a huge barrier, is a barrier to helping folks engage in the type of helpful activities that could be good and right for them. So it's not just about, okay, eat this or, or exercise in this way. It's also peeling back the internal stories that they have from various different forms of stereotypes and things that might also impact them wanting to engage, let's just say, physical activity. You know, if somebody wanted to get involved in your organization, mm-hmm. in the Coalition for food, health, food and Health Equity, I get those two mixed up, Food and Health Equity. How can we how can we find you? Uh, well, you can first go to our website, www.coalitionequity.org. You could visit us on Instagram at coalition underscore equity. Um, or you can visit our Ujama Cafe, which is our community refrigerators at Ujama spelled U-J-A-M-A-A. Uh, cafe um, on Instagram. And you also have a gala coming up. We have a huge gala coming up called the Love and Equity Gala. Um, It is our annual gala to support and help sustain all the work that we're doing. And so this February 14th, the Day of Love. Next week. (laughs) That's going to be next week. It's going to be next week. (laughs) The Day of of Love. um, We invite people to come and, one, celebrate the work that we've done the past year, but to just have a good time. I mean, one thing that Coalition is known for is good food. Um, so you're going to be serving bur- – it's going to be catered by Burger King? Yeah. It's going to be <laughs> It's going to be catered by a wonderful, delicious caterer. Um, and so come out, eat well. Support a great cause. Support a great cause. Yeah. But, but it's more than that. It's also being in community with people who are doing purpose-driven work. That's the beauty of our gala is that you're supporting us. But when you come into our gala – you literally can turn to your right or left, and there's somebody doing some amazingly dope ass work too. And, and, and wh- so, where where is this gala, and how could people find tickets to it? Or um, the gala will be held at White Eagle Hall in Jersey City. You can go to loveandequity.org, which is our gala website. 
you can always just, again, go to our main page on coalitionequity.org. Um, that'll take you to um, our gala as well to purchase tickets. Or you can just donate or you can sponsor tickets for someone who can't afford the gala to come and join us. You also have social media presence as well. You want to give that out? Dr. Leija. I mean, yeah. I mean, Dr. Leija. <laughs> Um, people can follow me and follow my adventures um, at Dr. Legia on Instagram. So just a, a quick note for, for the audience out there. That is how we came across Dr. Legia. Dr. Legia, I noticed at, all at once, followed all our pages. Followed all. Well, Mike, Mike told me to. Mike told you followed all our pages, and I'm like, and, th- and that She's, usually makes me note. I'm like, she usually says, okay. hey, hashtag Mike's army. Also, so then I, then I, <laughs> she heard episode nine. Yeah, Prairie Fire. Then I heard, then I heard <laughs> talk to Mike, and I go, Mike, because I saw it was Jersey City. And I go, Mike, who, who's Doctor Leecha Carter? And he tells me all about you. Mm-hmm. Then I get in contact with you, and here you are. Mm-hmm. You've had, you really got an uphill battle, and your suffering is not over mm-hmm. by any means. Mm-hmm. But going through what you did and trying your best to make your imprint on this world and leave this world a better place than you left it, what do you think the suffering of this journey has taught you? Well, first I want to say I've been suffering my entire life. <laughs> you know, I you know I have a very interesting uh, background and, and childhood experience. You know, the beauty of suffering is that, one, the lessons that you learn through struggle are priceless that you can't get from a textbook, you can't get from a lecture. But for me... Um, my journey uh, with suffering and and with really trying to build up this nonprofit and the work that we do is this beautiful divine resilience that is experienced on the other side of that. Um, And so it's through suffering are the lessons and the the teachings of how to be resilient, um, how to persevere, and that anything that is meaningful in life and purposeful in life will always be tough. Um, so yeah. You're hired. <laughs> you know, Kev, I was going to say, I know we're wrapping this up, but I can honestly say, I think the world needs more people like Dr. Carter. Absolutely. You know, she's so animated and so into what she's doing and you're doing it's great disgusting. work. It really is. <laughs> it may, it makes me hate myself. No, yeah. don't. <laughs> you no, I mean, you, you really are, you're into what you're, and you're doing great work, mm-hmm. you know, and you are so adamant about it mm-hmm. and it, it's just and you always have a you always have you had a smile on your face the whole time you were here and it's it, you, you could just tell your love for what you're doing mm-hmm. i mean what's what's not the love i mean when you know that one of the reasons why i left academia was because i i couldn't really see the full impact of what i was doing and with coalition and and with the community-based work that i do there is an immediate impact that happens by the decision that you make, that I make every moment in the day, which means that I am much more mindful about how how I move in this world because me doing what I do impacts so many other people and their ability to live well, right? But second to that, we have so many clients that call in and just say, you're helping, us, you're helping me eat healthier. You know, we have 80-year-old clients and 70-year-old clients, literally, that call in and they're like, Dr. Lee, they call me Dr. Lee. I can, I can, I'm able to manage my diabetes because of your program. I'm able to eat healthier because of your program. I'm learning. I had, we had one client who we, we have overnight oats as our breakfast option. And when our funding ran out one day, uh, one, uh, last, last year, he called up and he said, I love those overnight oats so much. I tried to make it myself. <laughs> he said they didn't come out as good, but I tried. And I'm like, just the exposure at least he to tried. something. At least he tried. The exposure to something healthy. The exposure to these options, right? Um, and then the way that we deliver it, making sure that it is in line with what our clients want. What is there not to smile about, you know? You're doing God's work, you know? You're, you're changing people's lives. Yeah. The, what, is there, what is there not to smile about, you know? So... I certainly appreciate what you're doing. And yeah, I thank absolutely. you so much for coming in here and talking about it. Mm-hmm. And I look forward to hearing some great things about you from you in the future. Uh, you're, once you're here, you're always family. We're always behind you. We'll always plug whatever you need to, to have plugged. And we look forward to great things. Cool beans. You. Yeah, you, you're a family now, so always <laughs> we, we expect you to be at all of our events. We'll come to all of your events. and I'd love to go to the gala. I really, really yeah. want to go to the gala. 
I don't you know. Will, you would have a terrific time at the gala. At least I'll be able to eat something because every every place I go, I can't eat anything because uh, I'm no. gluten free. Uh, no, you you will be well fed <laughs> at the gala. We pride ourselves on on the food, on the catering, on all the vibes. Yeah. <laughs> That's going to do it for this episode of the Suffering Podcast. And as always, let's think about all the stuff that we learned. Let's meet halfway in changing the system. The face of inequity comes in many forms. Poor diet has a litany of side effects. Provide what people need to thrive, not only to survive, but most importantly, dignify those you can and engage in purpose-driven work. That's going to do it for this episode of The Suffering Podcast. Don't forget to follow us on social media, uh, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. Follow Mike at Mike underscore Fillets. Follow me at Real Kevin Donaldson. Don't forget, you can always listen before you watch. All our episodes come out on Sunday at 4 a.m. And don't forget to visit popple.com for a nice 20% discount. Put in TSP20 for a nice digital business card. And we're going to see you on the next episode of Suffering Podcast.